Hello, this is your boy Feltar here, and welcome back to another episode of the Blue Monday Manchester City podcast. I have been tempted to retitle this the Blue Mendy podcast just because the guy has already come into Manchester City and has perhaps gained cult legend status at the club already. Now, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about last week's fixture against Brighton and Hove Albion, as well as previewing the next couple of weeks' games. So, we're going to be talking about Girona's friendly, which is going to be happening on Tuesday at 5 o'clock kickoff, I believe for that one and also the Everton game next Monday I'll probably talk a little bit about that but I'll probably leave most of it to next Monday's podcast also on top of that we're going to be talking through the latest transfer action at Manchester City so lots to cram in today's episode but to first get things kicked off let's talk about the Brighton game City's 2-0 victory on the south coast at the weekend a really positive result it was a fixture which in the past I've seen City lose or draw plenty of times in the past but under Guardiola we tried a new system we played with this five of the back system at left back we had Danilo at right back we had uh, Walker they were pretty much operating as wingers during the entire portion of the game because Brighton pretty much stuck 11 men behind the wall for the entirety of the game now I have to say that in the first half City if we had scored early on I think the game would have been completely different and in fact it probably worked in our favour having scored a little bit later into the game now we had good chances in the first half the best chance probably for Gabriel Jesus had a lovely header should have perhaps scored in fact he really should have scored he directed his header back across goal good save there by Matthew Ryan and his follow-up hit the post it was a chance which he really should have scored from but apart from that the first half was fairly drab City's tempo for me was a little bit too slow in the past we have to see lots of pace and I really do like the introduction of Leroy Sané and Sterling. Perhaps in these sort of games it's not necessary perhaps to play with a five at the back, maybe just a four at the back would do. I think that Brighton in this sort of fixture were never really ever going to push us too much over the halfway line. But in fact in the second half they were the ones which created a few chances early doors. A fantastic block from Vinny. Edison wasn't all too convincing in the game. His saves were fine, his kicking was all great. But when it came to a few balls into the box he looked it looks a little bit shaky, but in the past we've seen lots of our goalkeepers look shaky on their first couple of appearances, people like De Gea. He filled me with more confidence in goals than someone like Bravo, I have to say. But it took until later on in the game when we really took our chances and it all stemmed from Kevin De Bruyne who I believe was the man of the match not Kyle Walker. I thought Kyle Walker was decent, his pace gives us something completely different from what we've had in the last couple of years. Great down that right hand side, he was putting in good balls into the box as well and helping us link up with the midfield. His passing was good, he was helping create chances, playing good attacking football but for me De Bruyne was the main man in this fixture. He picked the ball up and it all came from Brighton being sat behind the the ball all game. Their tiredness eventually showed. Dale Stevens got the ball robbed off him. Ball into the midfield into David Silva who I don't think had all too good a game but when it mattered that ball was played into Aguero and he slotted home very nicely indeed. The rest of the game Aguero didn't do all too much. He didn't link up with Jesus all too much either but that's mainly I think because the fact that Brighton was sat so deep. There were so many people around him was just not much space at all for them two to really link up so it wasn't really the best exhibition of those two players linking up together up front but I have to say when it came down to it scoring that goal was very very important and it's a game in the past which I've seen City go on and draw and not just be able to get a goal in those sort of games. I think back to a game against Norwich a couple of years ago where we drew 0-0 away from home for example there's plenty of examples where City just haven't been able to break the deadlock. Games last year for example against Everton, against Southampton games like that where City just were not able to finally break the team down and get that goal but eventually City did do it and then we added a misery compiler a little later on Lewis Dunk nodded it into his home goal as you can see if you follow Benjamin Mendy on Twitter he described it as a bullet header good patter from Benjamin Mendy I've got to say he's already shaped me up to be a very very good lad good lad at Manchester City I've got to say especially judging by his social media actions now after the game Steven Gerrard and Frank Lampard in the BT Sports studio described it as a bit wrong to say about a player where you're playing in the middle of the game I personally think it's just banter get on with it Steven Gerrard a lot of people in the world actually have a personality unlike you 
And also say, Steven Gerrard, it's also a pretty bad thing to punch a DJ in the face in a nightclub for refusing to play Phil Collins. But hey, it was self-defense, as the court said, not the fact that you just belted him one in the face. But apart from that, overall, it was a good performance from City. Uh, it's exactly what was needed on the first day of the season. Just get those simple wins, 2 no win, away from Brighton, job done, and City go home very, very happy indeed. Now, talking about City, I suppose we should look at our title rivals. First of all, Liverpool. In their game, sure, they still can't defend and they still haven't addressed any of their problems. In fact, when I look at their side, are they any better than when Brendan Rodgers was the gaffer? I don't really know. I have to say, the side doesn't seem to have improved all too much. There's a lot more pace going forward than under Rodgers, but... Like I said, defensively, they're the same problems which were there two, three seasons ago. Then we're going across to Arsenal. Again, lots of defensive problems. I know they were missing some key players in their side. But even still, when you look at their defence man for man, do I honestly believe that any of those players would get into the current Manchester City defence? i probably say no. And despite the fact that they actually went on and won the game, and many Arsenal fans will say, well, looking at the fixture, it's just great character. It's good to see Arsenal come back and winning games where in the past we would have lost, which is all good and well. But for me, it only papers over many of the crap. And I have to say that Leicester team aren't exactly the best at defending either. But the big surprise of the weekend was probably Burnley's 3-2 victory away from home against Chelsea in a game where their players seem to have lost their heads. Now, the result was a big surprise, but looking at Chelsea's starting lineup, I know they have some players injured, and I know they also have some players unavailable due to suspensions, but looking at Chelsea's bench, and when you compare it to City's bench at the weekend, it really does go and show the fantastic strength and depth which Manchester City currently have at their side. Now, looking at the bench for us at the weekend, we had Mangala, who cost around 40 million, we had Bravo in goal, who cost 13 million, then we had young lad Phil Foden, then we had Yaya Torre, and then we had Sané and Sterling. When you compare it to Chelsea's bench, which probably their best player on the bench was Morata. How he didn't start, I have no idea. But then the next best player was probably Caballero. And the rest of them, I have to say, Andreas Christensen, who didn't really impress me too much in Munch and Gladbach last season. They had Tamori, who looked pretty decent in the under-18s. And a few other under-18 sort of players as well. It really does go and surprise me just how lacking they are in strength and depth. And if they want to do well in the Champions League and they want to do well in the Premier League, a side like that just simply will not work. And that's the reason why I believe they are a long, long way behind City and United at this current stage in the season. Spurs, again, their result was fairly similar to ours. However, Newcastle, the game changed when they got that sending off. And I don't think that game was really representative of how well Spurs will do this season. It was interesting to see, however, Carry Kane failing to score as he always does in August and then the final game which everybody seems to be talking about is the Manchester United win against a very very poor West Ham side now lots of people seem to have got this impression that United are now the best team in the entire world well they perhaps didn't watch the game against Real Madrid last Tuesday which is interesting to see because it made United look well well behind them in terms of quality now when I look at that side for Manchester United they have definitely improved defensively we'll have to see if Lindelof ever turns out to be any decent but in midfield Matic for me is a fantastic player and the fact that Chelsea let him go to of all clubs Manchester United is just seemingly absolutely ridiculous and then going forward, adding Lukaku, I think is a great sign. And I think he'll score 25, 30 goals this season, without a doubt, if he stays fit. And he never really ever seems to get injured. He's just a natural goal scorer. He scores goals from all sorts of areas of the pitch. He's very quick. He will go and take defenders on. He scores headers. And those were the sort of goals which he's shown in the game there against West Ham United. But I have to say that it's difficult to really read into too much about any of the games this weekend. It is a long, long way through the season, and if you're going to judge sides based on the first game of the season, it'll be very, very difficult to come out and guess who's going to be the winners. But for me, from the weekend's games, the teams which have shown the quality the most has to be City, United, and perhaps Spurs as well. Those three will perhaps be the ones challenging for the title end of the season. And I said in last week's podcast, City should be expected to win the league this season just based on the amount of investment they've bought into the club this year and the strength and depth of the squad. Anything less from me, I think, would be a huge disappointment for City this season. So as I said earlier, we're going to be talking about transfers as well. And at the weekend, City bought a new player. If you've heard of this guy, congratulations. You are one of the well-known football hipsters of Twitter. And I'm going to give a little bit of a crack at saying this lad's name. Ola Renwaju Coyote. 
City signed him from Austria Vien. Last season, he scored 17 goals in 33 games for Austria Vien in the Austrian Bundesliga. And he's going to be going out on loan to Girona. He also scored two goals in a game against Roma last season, so he obviously seems to be alright, but as far as I'm concerned, this lad will never play for City. He's probably going to be sold in a few years' time. It's just another one of those money-making sort of sessions which City do. In fairness, though, people from the Austrian League have gone on and succeeded in the Premier League. A prime example, perhaps, would be someone like Sadio Mane. So perhaps he could move over to City in a few years, but I very, very much doubt it. And it's probably another one of those money-making exercises which City have done several times over the last couple of months. People like Aaron Moy, for example, is just a money-making expert. And also, I'd also like to thank very much Nicholas Otamendi for finding Fabian Dell. For last week's podcast, I asked if anybody's seen Fabian. Probably should let the cops know because nobody's seen him in a long time. But thank you, Nicholas Otamendi. You've reassured me that he is still alive on your Instagram story the other day. On top of that, other transfer moves. Wilfred Boney is perhaps set to go and leave City. I know what you're all thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much. How have we deserved this to happen? But apparently he's actually leaving. It looks like he's going to be going to Swansea as soon as the Gilfie Sigurdsson deal is done. Another player leaving is perhaps Alexander Zinchenko. Apparently he could be moving to Napoli for some sort of loan fee plus perhaps a permanent transfer at the end of the season. Not really too sure why he was ever purchased in the first place. Doesn't look like City are going to make any money on him at all. On top of that, it looks like City could also be selling Fabian Delph. Apparently he wants to go on a loan move, but City have said he, if he wants to go on a loan move, it's not happening. It has to be a permanent transfer, so we'll have to see what happens with that one. And also a couple of us, including Jason Denea, he's linked to going back to Galatasaray, but City have said they only want to sell him for a permanent fee. And the final one is also the man, the myth. And that is Mr. Patrick Roberts. He apparently wants to go back to Glasgow to join Celtic. But City apparently wants to send him out on loan to Southampton to get Premier League quality. Lots of Celtic fans are saying, well, it's better to be in a side with a winning mentality than it is in a side like Southampton where you're not guaranteed to start many games. And yes, he will gain some valuable Premier League, and yes, he will gain some vital Champions League experience, but for me, I don't see him progressing at Celtic. They're probably going to win the league without him even touching the ball. So it's a little bit of a strange move for me, perhaps seeing him want to go back to Celtic. I feel like if Patrick Roberts wants to be happy, sure, he can go to Celtic, but... If Patrick Roberts wants to be better as a player and wants to improve as a side and whether he actually has ever any chance of actually playing for Manchester City in the future, a low move to a Premier League side would be favourable. But, as I said, those transfers, whether they happen or not, we'll have to see in the next couple of weeks. There's still a little bit left of time in the transfer window. I very much doubt City will buy someone unless a defender, for example, is sold. Apparently, we're still trying to buy Sanchez. That's never going to happen. I can't see a signing of Bappe give up hope in both of them but the big news this week is that City are playing a friendly away from home against my Girona but it's a strange game because City have played pre-season games during the season before we've played friendly games I remember we played in Abu Dhabi a couple of years ago against Hamburg we've played in front of the Sheikh a few times before as well but last time it really ruined City it really was a pointless exercise flying out Abu Dhabi mid-season Again, this is a strange one. It seems to be pretty much just a marketing exercise rather than real any football value behind it. It's sort of a way of increasing the Girona brand, the fact that City are able to play for them. City's owners have got a bit of involvement with the club and I think that they're probably going to try and buy it in the next couple of years as far as I can tell. But what the game actually appears to be is Manchester City reserves playing against Manchester City reserves. But it'll be a good exercise to see a few players getting games, perhaps Benjamin Mendy, Tosin Adebayaro, Patrick Roberts is included in the squad himself, a few of the younger lads as well, Daniel Grimshaw's in there, Phil Foden, Brahim Diaz, Zinchenko's even gone as well, so whether someone like Ilkay Gundogan may even get a start will be helpful for his fitness, certainly, but a few players have been left out, Cal Walker's been left out, but in terms of the rest of the squad, all the usual faces are there, Bravo, Danilo, Company, Stone, Sterling, Gundogan, Aguero, Mangala, De Bruyne, Fabian Delph has even been included, Leroy Sané, Bernardo Silva, David Silva, Mendy, Fernandinho, Nicolas Otamendi, Edison, Gabriel Jesus and Yaya Torre have all been included in this next game against Girona. Now, whether those players will play, I hope not. That's what i got to say. I hope that the main boys will not be playing because next week's game against Everton is a big fixture. 
Everton won their first game of the season and they're a side which are expected to do fairly well this season. They've put a lot of investment into their side, even though they have only got a very small net spend. Even though as well, they did only win by one goal to nil at the weekend. Everton are City's bogey team. They have been for years. We still struggle to score against them. And if the boys aren't fit enough at the weekend... I'll be a little bit frustrated and also disappointed if we don't walk away with that Everton game from a win. And it will also have a, probably a long-term effect, the fact that City have decided to play one extra game for no reason. So I, all I can say is I hope that they get no injuries from this game, especially Vincent Company, for example. If I see him playing, I will not be a happy bunny, I have to say. The kickoff, I believe, is at 5 o'clock, and I think there is a live stream for Citizen members. I absolutely despise that word with every single bone in my body. But still, there's apparently an exclusive live stream of the fixture available on Manchester City's website for Citizen members and season ticket holders. We'll probably be able to find a dodgy stream somewhere, but you didn't hear that from me. And then, of course, on top of that, there is a game next week against Everton. They looked okay at the weekend. Wayne Rooney was the man who scored for them. Lots of passion in that header. Perhaps could be a revitalised player, we'll have to see. But I have to say with Everton, as I said, I'm going to be previewing this game a little bit more in depth next Monday. I probably might, in fact, actually just do the podcast on a Tuesday. It's probably a little bit easier. We've got more to talk about that way. But still, they're a decent team, Everton. They didn't really perform exceptionally at the weekend, but they still won by one goal to nil. They've got a good blend of young players. Calvert-Lewin is starting to come through a lot more. He's got a lot of pace. was involved in the England under-20s team, which won the World Cup, of course, this last summer. And a few other players as well look interesting. Sandro Ramirez is a player who came over from Barcelona's academy, was bought from Malaga for fairly cheap, only six, seven million pounds. Gilfie Sigurdsson could, in fact, be an Everton player by next week. And there's a few other faces in their side which look very, very decent indeed. As I said, it's a bogey fixture. We're bad against Everton, but... If we change things around, I don't think we're going to be sticking with this 3-5-2 system again. I think we may actually play with wingers because they're not the quickest team in the world, Everton. And I think it's a game in which we can really get at them. So by playing wingers in this game, I think we'll probably be a little bit more advantageous. Again, you never really know what Pep Guardiola is ever thinking. We'll have to see when it comes down to it. But I predict wingers to play in this next fixture. But still... Very excited. First home game of the season. I'm a little bit gutted that it's Monday. It just seems like we're waiting forever and ever before we actually get to see City play a home fixture. But still, very exciting nonetheless. Thank you so much for joining us on the Blue Monday Manchester City podcast. If you guys still get a chance to see the man, the myth, the legend, Fabian Delph, please get tweeting in. I really want to know his every move. Thank you so much for watching. I'll read a virtue.